Hi blockchain and cryptography enthusiasts! Welcome to the very first episode of ZK Marek, where I explain the inner workings of all things crypto. In this episode you will learn about elliptic curves and how they are used in Ethereum wallet. Why are those fundamental to cryptography behind Ethereum and zero-knowledge proofs? Check out the link in the top right corner for the 2 minute teaser to find out. So here's the plan. First, to get the gist of it, we'll take a look at the general mathematical idea of elliptic curves. Then we'll look at prime fields, which are the arithmetics used in cryptography. Next, we'll combine them both into discrete elliptic curves. And we'll take a closer look at standardized curves used in real-life protocols. Armed with this knowledge, we'll unravel what private keys and Ethereum addresses really are. So let's start from the beginning and talk about elliptic curves. What is it? It's a set of points that form a curve defined by an elliptic curve equation. We will use the most popular version, Weierstrass form. Y squared equals x cubed plus a times x plus b for some a and b. And we are going to focus on specific example where a and b equal 0 and 7 respectively. This is the equation of SECP 256K1, the curve used in Ethereum. And here is how the curve looks on the real plane. And here is a point belonging to the curve. In cryptography, we don't care that much about the curves themselves, but more about the operations we define on the points on the curve. Namely, we would like to have three operations. Negating a point on the curve, adding two points on the curve, and doubling a point. So let's define these operations. To negate a point, we take its reflection about the x-axis. To do so, mathematically, we simply take the x and y coordinates and negate the second. And here's how we could implement this operation in Python. First, we need a class which stores x and y coordinates as floats. We'll call it CCAffine, which stands for Continuous Elliptic Curves Affine Coordinates, which is exactly the type that has x and y. We'll have a very simple constructor that will initialize coordinates with past arguments. Last but not least, we'll overload the negation operator, the one that will be called when we put a minus in front of a variable. It will return a new instance of CEC affine with the same x coordinate, but the y coordinate negated. Now let's look at the addition operation. It takes two points as an argument. Let's call them A and B. If we draw a line through two points on the curve, the line will intersect with the curve in the third point. Let's call that point C. We define addition by saying that adding three points on a single curve is always equal to zero. Straight from the definition, we deliver that C equals minus A plus B. And we already know what the negation is, simply reflecting a point about the x-axis. So we know where the A plus B lands. But wait, what is zero in point addition? We'll still go back to it in a moment. For now, Let's summarize how to do an addition. Find a third intersecting point, and its reflection is the result. If we look at the math of the addition, it is a little bit more complex than negation. First, we need to calculate the slope, which describes the angle between the line and the x-axis. With that, we can calculate the x and y of a C point with the following equations. And if we were to implement such an operation in the code, we would overload the addition operator and would simply implement the math from above. But wait, will there always be a third intersecting point? Well, almost. Let's move our point around and you can see the third point naturally finds itself. But as our A point moves towards the right closer to the B, but on the other side of the chart, you can see our intersection point goes to infinity. And exactly when A equals minus B, it reaches infinity, and there is no third point intersecting the line and the curve. The slope calculation now involves division by zero. Therefore, we'll extend the definition of our curve by adding one extra point. The point will lie beyond the continuous part of the curve and will be called point and infinity. And we'll define further that if we add any point A to minus A, it is going to equal the very same point at infinity and it will be our neutral element in addition operation. The equivalent of zero in numbers arithmetics. 
adding any number to zero equals the same number. And in case of elliptic curves, adding any point A to point at infinity equals to the same point A. As well as adding point at infinity to any other point B equals the very same point B. Thus, we'll represent the point as mathematical O, which resembles zero, to emphasize its role as a neutral element. We track the changes in the math. Now let's update the code. And again, we are rewriting math to Python code, almost one to one, supporting all three extra cases for addition with infinity point, and the common case remains unchanged. Finally, there is one more case in which a line drawn through two points on the curve doesn't intersect with the third one. Let's rewind and move A backwards all the way till it meets B. When we are adding a point to itself, there is only one point to draw a line through, and there is infinitely many lines going through a one point. Therefore, we'll need to do something else instead. Namely, we'll use the tangent line. And for that, we'll need to update the definition of the slope for this specific case. And we'll need to add one more case to our code as well. We'll call this operation of adding a point to itself doubling, and we'll extract it to a separate function. The function will look almost the same as a common case for addition, just with alternative calculation for the slope. All right, now let's switch gears and look at prime fields. Prime fields define clock-like arithmetics using cryptography. For example, if you add 9 to 2 on the clock, you will have 11. But if you add 11 and 2, you will have 1. So the clock is kind of like a prime field. Except, prime field starts with 0. So in the case of our clock, it would start at 0 and end at 11, which would be 12 numbers in total. Except the prime field needs to have prime number of elements. So if we start with 0 and have all the integers up to 12, that will give us 13 numbers in total. The total count of numbers is called the order of a prime field. So our modified clock is a prime field of order of 13. In cryptography, the order is usually very large. Many standards use the order close to 2 to the power of 256. In this video, however, we'll use order of 41 to illustrate our examples. And we will visualize the prime fields on the line axis instead of a round clock. Now let's code prime fields. We'll need a class that has two fields, the value of a given element and the order of our prime field. We can benefit from Python support for big numbers, as in many other languages, we would need to use specially designed types to support large enough values. When initializing a field element with value and order, we must remember to store the value modulo the order. We can now define our arithmetics by overloading equality, addition, subtraction, and multiplication operators. Each will start by asserting we are operating on a pair of fields with the same order. As operating on a fields on different order doesn't make sense in our context. To check if two elements of the field are equal, we simply check if their values are equal. To add, subtract, or multiply, simply add, subtract, and multiply values and create a new instance, which will ensure the value is stored modulo the order. There is also the operation of inverting an element, or, in more general case, division of two elements. This one is a little bit more complex, so I'll save it for another time. An exciting moment has arrived we can look at discrete elliptic curves used in cryptography. And here it is, a chart of discrete elliptic curve on prime fields of order of 41. And there is a plenty of things to note. Prime fields are on both axes. We left the world of real numbers and we are now in discrete world of prime fields. Therefore, the curve is now just a set of isolated points. The chart is symmetric, but there is a new symmetry axis in the place of X axis. It is horizontal line dividing the field into two halves. The number of points on the curve approximately equal the prime field order. In our case, there are 42 points, including the point at infinity. That's right, we will need the point at infinity again, which we'll reintroduce in a moment, so stay with me. For now, we note that in our example, the order of the prime field is 41, while the order of the group is 42. 
roughly for half of x coordinates, there will be two points belonging to the curve, symmetric to each other about the symmetry axis. In general, there will be a few points lying exactly on the x axis without the symmetric twin. In case of our curve and our prime field, there is only one. We can now redefine point operations, but this time on discrete elliptic curve. Let's look at negation. It might be a surprise that math works exactly as before. To negate a point, we simply mirror it about the symmetry axis, which translates to negation of its y-coordinate. To implement the operation in affine coordinates, we will need a new class. It has two members. We'll use the field type defined earlier in the section about prime fields, instead of floats. Same as with continuous elliptic curves, we would overrode the negation operator, which would return the new instance of the class with the second coordinate negated. Now let's look at the addition. Again, we are going to use the same operation in the new context. To add two points on the curve, we'll draw a line through those points to find a third point, an intersection with the curve. This time, it is just a standalone point belonging to the curve, and we'll need to negate the point to get the final result. The important difference is that the line might overflow the field and meet the third point on the other side, almost like in the old Pac-Man game. And then we look at the math, and it is exactly the same, except the underlying arithmetics is not real numbers, but a prime field. And the same goes for the code. Adding a point to its negation might also feel like deja vu. It requires us to add the concept of point at infinity, and a point will be our neutral element, with both math and code looking almost exactly the same as before. And if you were to make an update to math and code to include the doubling case, we would see no surprise either. Now we are ready to introduce the last operation, scalar multiplication. To multiply a point by a scalar k, means to add it to itself k times. From that follows that multiplying point by 1 will result in the same point, and multiplication of a point by 0 returns, did you guess it, the point at infinity. Note that we can replace some of the additions with doublings. This will reduce the amount of additions for big numbers, which is important to implement fast scalar multiplication. There are many highly optimized algorithms for fast scalar multiplication, and perhaps the simplest one is double and add. It iterates over the bits of scalar, calculating subsequent powers of 2, and add together those for which the scalar bit is set to 1. With this algorithm, we are able to multiply a point by 104 in just 8 doublings and 3 additions. Equipped with scalar multiplication, we can define subgroups on the curve. Take a generator point, let's call it G, and keep adding it to itself. This will generate a subset of points on the curve. The subset will be cyclic. At some point, it will reach the point at infinity, after which the cycle will restart with the generator. Take another point from the same subgroup to be our new generator, and one of the two things will happen. First, it might generate another subgroup, which is smaller and is a subset of the original subgroup. Second, it might generate the same subgroup as before, of the same size, with the same points, but in different order. So let's summarize the elliptic curves operation. We talk about negation, addition, doubling, and perhaps the most important one, multiplying by scalar. But in cryptography, operations we can do are equally important and those we can't do. In elliptic curve cryptography, discrete logarithm is an example of such an operation. It is an inverse operation to scalar multiplication. To put it simply, once you multiply a generator over a large scalar, you won't be able to reverse the operation and restore the scalar from the result. For such a condition to hold, we need a group of appropriate size and with the right properties. Thankfully, we don't have to figure it out by ourselves. There are cryptographic standards we can use. One example of such a standard is mentioned before SECP-256-K1. 
used by Ethereum and Bitcoin. The standard consists of the equation, the order of the prime field, and the generator point. You can see that the order of p is quite large, quite close to 2 to the power of 256. To put the number into perspective, it is far greater than the number of atoms in the universe multiplied by the number of nanoseconds from the Big Bang. Two other elements of standard follows. Order of a subgroup generated by the generator, and cofactor, which is the ratio of number of points on the curve to the number of points in the subgroup. In the case of SECP256K1, the cofactor is exactly one, so the subgroup consists of every single point on the curve. There are many other curves optimized for different purposes. And I will show you just one more example, curve 25519. It has a different equation on order, as well as more friendly looking generator point. It has cofactor of eight, which means the subgroup consists of every eighth element on the curve. This popular curve is used for key exchange in Diffie-Hellman algorithm using protocols like TLS, SSH, or HTTPS. So when you connect to your bank with your browser, the chances are this is the curves you are using. Now, as you get the sense of how discrete elliptic curves work, you are ready to build an Ethereum wallet. An Ethereum wallet is made of private key and an address. To create a private key, simply randomize a number. This is our scalar, usually stored in hexadecimal form. To create an address, first create a public key. A public key is a point on the elliptic curve. To create one, multiply the generator point by a scalar representing a private key. You are almost there. Take the point and serialize its coordinates in a hexadecimal form. Hash it with kayak256 hash function and take the last 40 characters. You made yourself an Ethereum address. Well, almost. Don't forget the distinguishable 0x prefix. You may notice that it is easy to generate an Ethereum address from a private key, but not the other way around, thanks to the infeasibility of calculating the discrete logarithm. Except not with small numbers like those in our example. And there is another question. What elliptic curve and generator point should we use? This is where SECP256K1 standard comes in handy. As your private key, take a large, truly random number between zero and the order of the prime field within the standard. Use the SECP256K1 elliptic curve, related generator point, and use fast multiplication to obtain a public key. The rest of the algorithm remains unchanged. Hash and trim. Now the private key is safe, except the one we just used, so please don't use it in your wallet. Now the question remains, how is the wallet used to secure Ethereum transactions? To answer that question, stay tuned for the next episode about digital signature algorithm. Thanks for watching ZK Marek channel.